Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Are we ready to worship this morning? Amen? Join us.
love you today.
unto you, that our worship would be a beautiful aroma, Lord God, that we would fill your house with our worship as we pour our love on you, Father, as we pour our love, God. We love you this morning. You're worthy. You're worthy of all the honor and all the glory. Hallelujah. Hey! 
God, we worship you. And Lord, we, we come before your throne. Lord, we come before you and we worship you. And Lord, as, as we just sang, uh, Lord, we, we pray that our hearts would, uh, would, would be a throne for you, Lord. That this reminds me of uh, Revelation uh, 4 and 5. And uh, John gets a little glimpse of, uh, of the throne in heaven. And, a day, and it says here that there were creatures, and day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then just a few verses right, uh, later, uh, the elders lay down their crowns before the throne, and they say, You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And then all together in chapter 5, they say, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. God, we come before you, and you are holy, Lord. This is just the best way of describing who you are, Lord. You, you are holy, and you deserve our, our praise and our worship, Lord. Lord, and I pray that uh, once we get to heaven, this wouldn't be a culture shock for us. I, I pray that uh, day and night we would be uh, worshiping you already here, Lord. In, in whatever way this may look like, whether this is in in our singing, uh, but uh, we can worship you in so many other ways. Just worship you by uh, living a, a holy life, living a, a life that pleases you, and not getting into things that are from the world or of the world, but uh, just from you, Lord. Lord, and uh, we, we don't get this glimpse uh, of heaven and your throne but lord we, we are standing before you and we, we are in front of your throne and we praise you lord you're holy and and lord everything was created by your will everything that happens that that happened before that happens now lord we are created by your will and Lord, we surrender to your will. Lord, we, we bow down before you and surrender our lives, our, our agendas, our desires uh, to you, Lord. Lord, and we pray that uh, we would just continue to seek your will, that we would uh, be willing to, to step out of this like Peter stepped out of the, of the boat and just, uh, yeah, get get into this uh, unknown maybe where 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 we give up our our plans, where we give up our our thoughts just to to uh, be with you, to to have you do you have you do it your way, Lord. You will be done in our lives. And Lord, we know this is the perfect will. This is not just an idea. This is not just a, a tryout thing. But Lord, your will is perfect. And we know that and we trust in you. Lord, thank you that you help us that in that time that are challenging, in a time where we may not see the, the goodness of your will, help us to always trust you and, and to know that you have a plan and that you make everything work. In Yeshua's name, amen. Would you join us as we sing the Shema? Shema Yisrael Adonai Oh, 
King of Kings community, her Dalia family, good morning or evening, wherever you are. We're so happy that you joined us today. We know that God is going to speak into each and every one of your hearts as we draw close to him today. I want to give a big shout out to all of you that have been joining us the past weeks at Bryceland Gardens Park, right near the congregation. We have been having such a great time being able to gather there. It's been so refreshing being able to be together once again, and the kids are loving it too. So join us again this Saturday at 10 to 12 p.m. at the park. Don't forget to pack some food and water or a hot drink. And for those of you who are still not able to join us in person, we will continue to stream our services, which will be available on Facebook and YouTube. I want you to know that we're praying for each and every one of you. We miss you and we love you. We are a congregation that believes in the power of prayer. So if you have a need or a prayer request, please connect with us at kkch at kkch.org. Young adults, mark your calendars. We will be having a very special night of worship, September 10th at 7 p.m. right here at the congregation. You won't want to miss this incredible opportunity to encounter God as we seek Him and worship Him together, united. If you are new to Herzliya or you've been a part of our community, we encourage you to get plugged into a community group. We believe, especially in this season, we need to be encouraging, challenging, praying and strengthening our relationships with one another. We cannot go through life as a believer alone. We need one another. So if you're interested in more information about how to get plugged in, please email us at kkch at kkch.org. If you're a part of a community or you feel led at any time, you can give your tithes and offerings online or on our website at kkch.org, or you can drop it off at the park or at the congregation. God bless you as you give. Well, that's all the announcements for this week. We hope you have a blessed day. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you, even though we are not with you. Uh, we are with you in spirit. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew Escobar. Um, no, Daniel did not just grow hair all of a sudden. I, I'm on staff here at King of Kings Community Herzliya, usually working with the children, but today I am honored and privileged to be bringing the Word of God uh, for this morning or this afternoon, whatever time you're watching. We have been working through the parables of Yeshua, and this is our last week in that series. Next week, we are going to start looking at the biblical feasts because we are moving into a time period called the feasts where we look at uh, Sukkot, we look at uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new Jewish year, and Yom Kippur. So we'll be exploring some of those, and Pastor Daniel will be going through the scriptures and exploring these. But today we're going to be finishing up our series on parables, and I want to bring to you a little-known parable. It's kind of stuffed in the middle of Luke, and barely any attention gets put onto it, but I think it's very important. So if you'll open up to the book of Luke chapter 17, Luke 17, and we're going to start at verse 7. But first, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are honored and privileged to be servants in the house of God. We are privileged that, that we not only get to be face to face with you, but we have your Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Lord, that you give your, you trust us with your Holy Spirit, Father. We are temples of your Holy Spirit. Father, I come to you not today with any kind of lightheartedness about this uh, the heaviness of this word and the scripture that you have given me to speak and preach and teach on. Lord, I take this very seriously. I take this as a burden of a servant, Father. I want to be trustworthy for you to put your word on me, on my tongue and on my lips, Father, and that I can deliver this with, uh, with, uh, with genuineness, with an honesty, Lord, and with clarity, Lord, not twisting your scriptures in any way. Father, guide me as we uh, go through your word and through this precious parable in Yeshua's name. Amen. So let's first read this passage in Luke chapter 17, verse 7. And the parable is the parable of the unprofitable servant. 
Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't the master rather say, prepare my supper and get yourself ready and then wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was supposed to do, what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything that you are told to do, you should say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. I worked for a few years in children's ministry in Texas, and Part of my responsibilities on Sundays and on Wednesdays was to set up our auditorium, set up the room, however it's supposed to be, uh, for that service, and then I would tear down the room after everything was over on Sundays and on Wednesdays. And what we had is we had a uh, we had chairs that we had to set up. We had a few games for the kids to play before and after service, and then we had some candy at the back that we would use to give to the uh, give to the kids, give to the students as a reward to reinforce if they've done something good or something that we want to reinforce. Well. At the end of service, I would start putting things away, and I would get some of our, our adult volunteers or our teenage volunteers to help start setting things up and putting things away. Sometimes I would get our, uh, our staff, our paid staff, of course our paid staff has to do their work and put things away. But then very often, some of the kids that were there at many of the services and kind of knew, knew us a little bit, they were regular attenders, they would ask to help us put things away. So there was little duties that needed to be done. They'd have to pick up the trash, maybe, and I'd, of course, <laughs> allow them to do that. Uh, they'd have to straighten the chairs. Some of them might have uh, asked to go get the garbage out of the boys' and girls' bathroom because the adults were not allowed in there while the kids were in the room. So I would have some of the kids go bag that up, and some of them would take the candy in the back and lock it in our room so people throughout the week wouldn't sneak an M&M or two. So... This would happen at the end of every service on Sundays or on Wednesdays when we had service. And after some of the kids would help me, very often I would reward them, not in front of everybody, but in secret. I'd say, here, ha have a piece of candy for reinforcing that good behavior. I didn't promise it to anyone. I just gave it to them at the end of the day. Well, I had one very bright boy. Uh, that joined our classroom. His name, I'm going to call him Lawrence. I'm not going to give his real name. Lawrence was very bright, and he would come to me and, and notice that all of this was happening, and uh, with a pure heart, he would just start kind of helping along too. He would pick up the trash and, and throw it away and straighten all the chairs, and after he would do that, he would come up to me with his big eyes and say, Mr. Matt, he was very respectful, Mr. Matt, uh, I put the trash away and the chairs away. And the first time he did it, I was like, oh, thanks, Lawrence. I appreciate that. I'd give him a little piece of candy, and he'd be on his merry little way, chomping his candy. Well, the next week, he would do the same thing. Uh, he would pick up the trash, straighten the chairs, and then he would come after every single task that he did. He would come up to me. Mr. Matt, I, I, I did this. Mr. Matt, I took the trash out. Oh, thanks. Uh, can you put the candy baskets away? Yes, sir. He was very respectful, very respectful. Uh, yes, sir, I can do it. I gave him a little piece of candy. Finally, after weeks and weeks of this, I was very busy one day and dealing with a, a few things, and he came, comes up to me in the middle of, of what I'm doing and says, Mr. Matt, I, I put the trash away, and I took the trash out, and I straightened the chairs, and I, and I, and I, and I put the candy away, and, and, and I was like, okay, thanks, Lawrence. I really appreciate it. I, I got to go do this other thing right now. And I noticed a little later he kind of walked off skulkily and was kind of sitting in his chair, bent over, and had a sad look on his face. And I didn't bother much about it. Kids get mad. Kids get sad. I, I don't think about it so often unless they continue to be sad for a long time. But I, after a little while, I eventually noticed what was going on with him. I kind of came over. He was sitting by himself. I said, Lawrence, what's going on, man? How, how you doing? He said, nothing. I just put all the the stuff away and the candy away and did everything you said to do, but I didn't get my candy. I said, Lawrence, I never promised that I was going to give you candy. 
I, I really appreciate your, your heart to serve and to do everything, but you're getting older and you're becoming a bigger kid. You know, we don't serve in the house of God just to get our candy. We serve because it's our heart to serve. And he was a bright kid. He picked this up after a few weeks, and by the time I left Texas, he really didn't uh, ask for the reward anymore. But this is the very attitude that we are addressing, this, this sort of entitlement for the reward, this thing, I earned something from God. See, in my parable, that, my parable, in Yeshua's parable that I read, it talks a little earlier, if you rewind, that Yeshua was giving this parable mostly to his apostles. And this is the very attitude that he wanted to remove from the apostles' thinking. See, the apostles were going to be the foundations of his body, the assembly of God on the earth. And Yeshua understood that if his congregation was truly to be a living body, like, think about your body, if it was going to be like a living body, that, like many of our literal bodies today, it could not be top-heavy. Top-heavy. A top-heavy body. I'm not talking about weight gain. Maybe you're a little plushy on top than you are on the bottom. But that's not what I'm talking. I'm not plushy anywhere, praise God. But it's not because I exercise. I, I don't exercise. Some of you are really good at exercising. I'm looking around the room, and some of you really like to exercise. That's, that's not me. I'm not an exerciser. Some of you are animals at that. And from what I hear about exercising is that each day, if I understand correctly, each day you work on a different part of your body. Is that right? Is that correct for the most part if you're an avid work, worker-outer? Maybe one day you'll focus on the chest. I don't know what you do for chest. Do you do this? So one day you focus on the chest. Maybe one day you focus on the arms or the shoulders. One day you focus on your cardiovascular. You, you might run, get your heart rate up. One day you might, what are other parts of the body? I guess your abs. One, one day you, you do your abs. One day you rest. But what I understand is particularly important is something that the kids call leg day. Leg day is the day that you put resistance on your legs and you do squats or I don't know what you do. I don't work out. I've said that before. So you do some kind of leg exercises. And some people find these exercises, from what I understand, undesirable. They're not fun to do because I guess it causes more resistance. It's, it's harder. It's just not, the, it's not everyone's favorite workout day. Leg day. But there's a warning against skipping leg day because there's pictures, uh, funny pictures, and I don't know if they're Photoshop, but people that are really bulky and, and big on top, and then they've got these skinny legs like me. So they're really heavy on top, and they're really focused on what's on top, and then everything in the bottom is skinny, and there's, no, there's nothing to support it. They're top-heavy. Or like a, a, maybe you have a SUV or a sports utility vehicle, something that's really big on top. If you go fast enough around a, long, a sharp enough curve, then that kind of top-heavy vehicle might have the chance to tip over or fall. You can't do that. Where I'm from in Michigan, if you take one of those big vehicles down a, a, a sharp turn when there's snow and ice, that thing is going to tip over and you're going to lose balance. Yeshua was speaking to these apostles. These apostles were truly extraordinary people. They were closer to Yeshua than anyone else. They were his friends. They were witnesses of his glory. They were doing these fantastic miracles. Healed, healed, raised from the dead. Demons out. They were doing these tremendous, uh, tremendous works to proclaim the kingdom of God. They would be the first ones to receive that power of the Holy Spirit from on high. And they ended up being the foundations of what we are today globally as the people of God. Paul says in Ephesians 2.20 that this assembly of God's people is built upon, yes, Yeshua, but upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets with Messiah Yeshua himself as the chief cornerstone. These apostles that Yeshua was telling this parable to were going to be foundational. And guess what? That can get to your head. And guess what? That did very often get to their head. They thought they were something else. They thought they were something of themselves. 
But was it James and John that said something to Yeshua that says, we want to be sitting on your right and left hand as when the new kingdom comes and upon your throne of glory. They thought that they were hot stuff because of the works that they were doing. If their attitude was not right in this matter, Yeshua knew that it could trickle down from that top heaviness to uh, it could move down from that top heaviness down to the rest of the body of believers. Yeshua said, like a little bit of leaven that worked its way down into the dough. Just a little bit of entitlement. Just a little bit more of thinking of themselves more highly than they ought to, as Paul puts it. Getting a little too comfortable in the position that they had been chosen for as stewards of the eternal treasures of God. I deserve this. Sure, I'm a servant, but I'm the best servant. I'm the best servant. It's like, I, I like the illustration of when uh, two kids, I only have one, but if two kids draw a picture for their daddy, okay? Of course, daddy loves both pictures because they're from his kids. They're, oh, that's a beautiful whatever that is that you gave me that's beautiful is that a is that a smiley face no it's a cactus okay whatever so you know the objective pictures aren't maybe that pretty but daddy loves them both because they're from his daughters or they're from his sons oh they're beautiful they're precious but what if the two kids start fighting? Well, mine's better. I'm closer to Picasso than you are. I'm closer to, uh, to, to Michelangelo's work than you are. Okay, fine. But they're both, if we look at them in objective light, both of these pictures are garbage. I mean, they, they don't, you have kids. My kid's drawn me something before. It's, I love it because he's my son, but it's, it's not that great. I mean, it's not objectively that great in the light of what could be done. You know, I, I like to think of that illustration when I do my work for God, and I think I've got such a great sermon prepared, or I'm, I'm just moving on such power, and I have a word of knowledge, and oh, wow, God, you've given me this tremendous gift of prophecy. Well, next to what God can do, what I'm doing is really, really minuscule, and we should see ourselves in that light. The apostles had the danger of becoming top-heavy, so that those at the top would have this sense of bigness about themselves, and that attitude could work its way down into the rest of the body, making us powerless. Too big on themselves, and the whole thing topples over. We see this through what is called church history, a movement of God could begin on fire with everyone being humble and being grateful. And, you know, the whole thing is marked by God's glory. And then the more generations you move down the line, the more sophisticated maybe the whole thing gets. The more elegant their robes are, the more higher sounding their titles are, the more prestigious their ministers are. They might have political savvy down the road and maybe they're gifted orders. And soon, the whole movement becomes top-heavy, top heavy, powerless, and dead. The movement might be there in name or denomination or their history only. Maybe they've got some good doctrine on paper, but they've wandered so far from the vision and the lifestyle of the original that they wouldn't even be recognizable to their founders. It's become so bad that even the word minister has come to become, mean like a, a high official, some, something either religious or political high official. It's a title. I used to like when people called me Minister Matthew Escobar. Uh, ooh, Minister Matthew and Daniela Escobar. Ooh, thank you very much. That's a very kind thing for you to say to me. Or, or Minister, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. What does that mean? He's the most high official in the Israeli government. But what does the word minister really mean, both in the Bible and in the English language? All it means is servant, a common servant. So our whole thinking can be very quickly turned upside down. But this little parable throws down this whole system. 
The narrative comparing the apostles to lowly servants just doing their duty, it might sound a little bit harsh because in the parables of Yeshua, he uses broad exaggerations and some hyperbole to get his point across. But in actuality, this parable is like God's protection for us as believers, especially those of us who are leaders or want to be leaders. It keeps us grounded in our mindset of serving God. So in keeping with the spirit of Yeshua's telling of this, I'm going to give you three points, three points that sound at first maybe not so exciting, but just with whatever Yeshua says, these are good news. So my first point today is I am a servant. Can you guys, the five of you in this room, can you say that? I am a servant. That's not something we normally would get woohoo about, but we're going to talk about this. I am a servant. I'll read verse 7 again. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Well, he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat. See, we are servants, but we can be happy servants. When the queen of Sheba visited Solomon, she looked at everything in Jerusalem, the temple and, and the house that he had built for himself, the sacrifices being made, and he looked, she looked at the servants that were sitting, uh, serving Solomon at his table, the king's servants, and she gasped and said, wow, how happy are these servants? How blessed are these servants? See, we can be joyful by serving God in the house. And I dare say, if we are not joyful as servants, then maybe we have the wrong mindset about which Lord we are serving. See, this is written to a people who were, what does it say? Suppose one of you has a servant plowing the field or looking after the sheep. Well, in today's language, looking after the sheep could mean a pastor, uh, plowing the field could mean someone who is an evangelist, a, a minister of the gospel. And all of these are equated as servant. The great apostle Paul said about himself in Ephesians 3, 7, I became a servant of this gospel. Does he say, and it stinks? No, he said, hey, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace to me. You can almost hear him smiling through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of the apostles and of the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach. See, he considered it a gift to be a bondservant. So what does it mean to be a servant? It means our life is not our own. Your thoughts are not your own. Your time, your decisions are not your own. I'm going to talk to someone today. Your money is not your own. If we are bondservants, everything in our lives belongs to our Lord and our King. Well, that stinks, doesn't it? Kind of feels like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a servant. But on the other hand, what else doesn't belong to us? Provision, the, the means for provision, that doesn't belong to me either. When, when, you have a, when, when you have a servant, you're not, uh, the servant's not concerned about where his next meal's coming from. A servant back in those times, a bond servant, wasn't concerned about where he was going to lay his head to sleep or what house he was going to live in. All of that was provided by the master. If we are bond servants and we are obeying God's word, I have a, a spiritual father that used to say, he, he likened, he was in the army, the U.S. Army, and he likened being a bond servant to the Lord, like being in the army. He said, I follow orders, I do what they tell me to do, I go where they tell me to go in the army, and guess what? Every one of my meals is there, my housing's over the, always there, everything that I need is always there because I follow directions. We are a bond servant. We, we, we are not, uh, worry doesn't belong to us. We belong completely to another. Someone might say, didn't Yeshua say, I no longer call you servants, but friends? Yeah, he did. And that, that's such an awesome thing to be friends of Yeshua. We can be his friends, but that doesn't discount the fact that we are servants. He says, yes, we are friends if you do what I tell you to do. I, I, maybe in the natural you have friends like that that they're only your friends if, you, if they do what you tell you to do. But maybe that's not the most healthy friendship in the world. But with Yeshua, it's a very healthy friendship. 
We do what he tells us to do as his friends. And so our servanthood goes just beyond our duty, but we get to be let in on what the master's plan is, and we get to understand his purposes even greater. So our work for him and our service is even that much more impassioned. We are many things. I'm a father as well as a husband, as well as a son, as well as a grandson, as well as a manager and a director of this and that, as well as a children's director. See, I have many roles, and we can have many roles too as believers. We are a child of God. We are a son or daughter of the Most High King. We are kings in this earth. We are the bride. We are friends of God, but we are also servants. So I want you to listen to this. We are not only a servant, but we are completely servants. We are not only a servant, but we are totally servant. All the apostles called themselves servants at different times in their letters. Paul called himself a servant in Philippians. Peter called himself a servant. James or Yaakov called himself a servant. Yeshua did not come to serve, but to be served. Philippians 2, 6 that said that Yeshua, who was in the very form of God, did not consider equality of God something to be used to his advantage. But he, what? He humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, being in the appearance of man. So even though he had this identity, and even though we have this identity as child of God, bride of the Messiah, kings and queens in this earth that get to make declarations and have the power of the holy spirit yes we have all that but at the same time we don't take that identity and put it on ourselves and and just stand in that we also humble ourselves as yeshua did as a servant we have the identity like yeshua but we consider ourselves servant so we are servants i am a servant but how does this play out in real life I want to look at verse 8. Won't the master rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink, and that after that you may eat and drink? See, we often come to God with a consumer mentality. A consumer mentality. You, God, I want you to do this and this and this for me, and then I'll maybe worship you if I have time at the end. Do you know why when we come to congregation or community group, very often we worship first? Not because we need to get the preacher warmed up and get him emotionally ready to, to say his thing. No, we worship God because we are putting this into action. We want him, we want to serve God first. We want to render God unto God the worship that he is due. And not just when we're done with our three songs. No, when we sense that we have poured out our lives and our worship and our song to the Lord, then we can be fed. Your main reason for being in congregation or for coming into community is not so that you can be fed the word of God. Our main purpose for gathering together is to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to serve him with our whole lives. That is the purpose of us meeting together, waiting upon the Lord. Psalm 123 says, Behold, as the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to our God until he has mercy on us. Let's just take a minute to worship him, just to know his pr- Father, we love you. We honor you. Maybe, if we, maybe we skip past the first part of the Facebook Live or YouTube Live video or, or some of that and, and said, well, I'll just come back to the teaching. No, we want to take this time to honor you as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who have given us everything, who has brought us into his kingdom. We worship you, Lord. We honor you, Father. We give you glory, God. As the ha- eyes of our Uh, of, of the servant look to the hand of their masters so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us see when we serve God and wait on God in any context he'll eventually have mercy on us he will eventually meet us he will feed us he will reward us we can be sure of that 
See, we're not throwing out the whole idea of, well, we're not going to get rewards. We should just expect to be whipped by God. No. See, Paul ran. He said, I run so that I might obtain a crown. Yeshua talked time and time again about rewarding servants. But the point of this parable is not that God owes us something for our service. He rewards us not because of the great things that we've done. He rewards us because he is good and he has so much grace to reward us. It's from the goodness purely of his heart. What does the scripture say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. Yeshua said, blessed are the meek, and they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and they will have the kingdom of heaven. See, we are not only a servant, because we get rewards. We, we get God saying, well done, good and faithful servant, but yet we are totally a servant. So number one, I am a servant. Number two, let's read verse nine. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Number two, I am unneeded. Number one, I'm a servant. Number two, I'm unneeded. I'm not needed, but I'm wanted. Guys, the kingdom of God will run without you. I promise you that. If you walk away from the whole thing today, the kingdom of God will keep on running. This congregation will run without you. If you left today, you know what? We're not going to fall apart. God can do this whole thing without us. This world was going on before you were born, and guess what? It'll be here when you die. God's not going, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness Daniela showed up. Oh, I needed someone to lead worship today because I just, I can't stand Pastor Daniel singing to me. Oh, my God. I needed, da I needed, Miss da I needed Pastor Daniela to sing. See, God's not going, thank goodness you're here. He chooses to use you. There's a story in Esther where Mordecai is pleading with Esther to, to go to the king to save the Jewish people. And Esther's a little hesitant to do it. And Mordecai sends back this answer. Do not think because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to the royal position for a time as this. God did not need Esther to save the Jewish people. He's, I can raise it up from somewhere else, but he wants to use Esther. He wants to use you. Psalm 50 talks about people would be giving these sacrifices, and, and it wasn't with their whole hearts. And God said, listen, I don't need your cows. I don't need you to feed me. I, don't, I have the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need this sacrifice to you. John preached to the Pharisees and Sadducees. I can, God can take these stones, just because you're Pharisees and sons of Abraham, look, God can take these stones and make children of Abraham out of these. So in the strictest sense, God really does not need us. But the whole point of God's plan in this age is that he uses broken vessels like us to contain and pour out and distribute the glory of God. Humble servants, and he puts his glory inside of us. It's a good thing that we are not indispensable because this whole kingdom of God would have collapsed a billion, billion times already. Imagine the first time Peter screws up after Yeshua has gone up to heaven. The first time he, he, he you know, pulls away from the, the Gentiles and eats with the Jews because he's afraid. First time he messes up. Oh, great. Well, we needed Peter. Now he screwed up. Yeshua's up in heaven. Oh, we can't do it without Peter. I guess, uh, I don't know, Father, you got any other plans redeeming the world? No, they, it doesn't depend on you and me. It doesn't depend on us to, for this thing to run. We're not needed, but we are wanted. He treasures us, and he wants us. I have something here, and I have something that I do not need, I'm going to show it to you, and I'll put it up to the camera so you can see. These are little toys, figurines, that I like to collect, Japanese toys, um, vintage from the 90s and from today as well. They are unneeded. 
I do not need them whatsoever. They give me no purpose whatsoever. And my wife especially would say that I certainly do not need these little toys. They're, they're worthless. They're, they're junk uh, to her eyes. But in my eyes, I really enjoy collecting these Japanese toys. They are not needed, but they are something that's wanted. And not only are they unneeded, they are unprofitable. And that's our third point today. First, I'm a servant. Second, I'm unneeded. Third, I am unprofitable. Let me read verse 10 one more time. So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. Some of your Bibles, instead of unprofitable, it might say unworthy or something else or worthless that word can mean so many different things and it's only used twice in the new testament but in light of the context really the the best thing that it means is unprofitable see we're not saying these servants should give a show of fake humility oh oh i'm 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 all poor me i don't i can't do anything right god i'm just a worthless piece of junk that that's not what the scripture's saying here Look at this. I'll use the illustration of my toy. See, this plastic is probably worth 40 cents. Uh, when it was on sale in the 90s, it was probably 10 bucks. Uh, I bought it for, I think, $30. So it really is, um, really is worthless. The plastic and labor alone, probably its inherent value is probably maybe $5. Given the age, maybe $20. I bought it for $30, so I might have lost $10 on both of these things. It was an unprofitable transaction. And really, if I got appraised or something like that, it would be very likely worthless. If I went and resold it, it's worthless. But to me, because I like the way they look, and because I have a collection of them, I really value these things. My wife would very often agree with me in saying I, this was an unprofitable transaction. But I really do value these things. They, they're not worth much, but, and I lost money by buying them, but I value them. What about us? God ransomed us. He bought us with the most precious treasure that he has, his own son. And what were, what were we at that time? After this parable, Luke goes on to tell the story of ten lepers. They're seen as almost monsters at that time. Putrid, smelling, filthy, outcast, with flesh literally rotting off their bones. They obnoxiously interrupted Yeshua, this Messiah, on his divine mission, flailing their arms back and forth and yelling at the top of their lungs from the outskirts of this unclean Samaritan city, Help! Have mercy on us, son of David! On top of that, Yeshua does heal them, but only one of those ten even thanks him for the healing that Yeshua then graciously gives them. The rest of these lepers take it for granted and shrug it off that this Messiah would king would take the time to serve them. I ask you to see yourself as one of these, that the Father would take his precious lamb as ransom, laying down his glory to save this lot with no guarantee that we would even care or say thank you Truly, this was an unprofitable transaction. Some people criticize the song, Reckless Love, uh, because they think, well, God's love isn't reckless. They think of a reckless driver just kind of going everywhere on the road. But that's not how I see this song at all. God's recklessness is in what is seen as human behavior. Who would fight for an enemy? Who would leave 99 sheep to go after one? Who would purchase these leper people, these servants who are truly unprofitable, and then has the audacity to call them his friends, to let them in on his grand master plan for the universe and for all eternity, to adopt them and give them privilege as kings, to put inside of him the gifts of his Holy Spirit, God himself, the divine personality? Yeah, this is a great deal for us, but it can't be said that it was the same thing for him. It was unprofitable. We, I often describe my wife, and I encourage all husbands to describe their wives as saying, I'm married up. I married someone that was better than me, more beautiful than I deserve, more, much of a better personality than I 
uh, deserve. In that sense, we are all married to, to God in that same way. We all married way up. By all accounts and in honest, unobjective terms, we are unprofitable. We might do good. We're not useless. We might do useful work through him. We do greater works than Yeshua. And through the power of God that works within us, we're able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ask or even imagine. We're not worthless. Colossians 1.12 says the Father has made us worthy to share in his inheritance. He's rescued us from an evil dominion of slavery and brought us into the kingdom of light. So we're not worthless, we're not useless, but he has bought us at such a price at a loss to himself, which is the definition of unprofitable. To trade a son for lepers who don't know you. To trade Yeshua for us as servants. Unprofitable, but cherished and valued. Some of you kind of see this as harsh. You can't reconcile the, this parable with the love of the rest of the Father. But Hebrews 12, 28 says, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Who receives a kingdom? Sons receive a kingdom. The king dies, then you, you get the kingdom. If you're his son, you're the prince, you're, you're the new king. We receive a kingdom as sons and daughters, but since we are receiving this kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship or serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For a God is a consuming fire. We serve him because we understand the insurmountable love of the Father. I'm going to end with this story. There was a man from England in the 1800s that came to the United States, went to California, made his fortune in California. And after a time living in California, he wanted to make his way back across the sea to England and see some of his family and people. And he sent some money ahead of him and came down the Santa Fe Trail, came down to Louisiana. And in Louisiana, which is more in the east, he went to New Orleans, which was a big city and is still a big city in Louisiana, and did what most tourists to uh, New Orleans did. He went to what was then the slave market, and at that time, they were still selling, buying and selling slaves for auction. And he observed what was going on, and he saw slaves being brought up to the block, and he saw one slave girl that was brought up, and uh, African-American girl, and she was very beautiful, and he overheard two of the other men in the crowd beginning to talk among themselves, vile, awful things that they wanted to do to this young woman, and he, he got so mad, and he, he started seeing the auction go off, and people bidding, and, and bidding, and raising the, the price higher and higher, and he was enraged so much that he started shaking, and to the point where he couldn't take it anymore, so he raised his voice and gave a bid that was exactly twice as high as the last bidder had bid. Everyone looked back at him and gasped and said, how? Why would he? That was, that was more than any slave had ever gone in this market ever before up until that point in history. And so it was sold to him. The man went up to the auctioneer and he said, do you have the money? He said, yes, I do. He gave him the money for the slave and, and, and brought him over to the, the slave girl and um, they brought her down from the block and when she was about eye level at him, she had made a mouth of spit and proceeded to spit at the man who had just bought her and said through her teeth, I hate you. The man wiped the spit from his face from the back of his hand and led the girl down, down the street to another building nearby, led her inside the building. She didn't know what it said, for she could not read. Brought her up to the clerk uh, that was sitting behind the desk and the man said something to the clerk at the desk and the, the clerk protested and said no no you can't do that and the man said yes you have to it's it's the law gave him some money the man went the clerk went to the back and got a form and brought it back to the desk signed it and handed it to the handed it to the man and the man took it turned to the slave girl handed it to her and said these are your manumission papers. These are your emancipation papers. You, you are free. 
And the girl looked at him, didn't quite understand what he said. She said, uh, he said, and she said, I hate you more than anything. And he said, no, don't you understand? This are your manumission papers. You are free. And she looked down at it and she said, why did you do this? Why did you do this? He said, I bought you to set you free. And she looked down at the paper again, just fully trying to grasp what had happened. Her mind may be going back to when she was torn from her parents and brother and sister, how no one had ever given her any kind of dignity or worth in her life, how she was looked at, abused. She looked down at this paper that she could not read where it said manumission, certificate of manumission, that she was free. And she collapsed down on her knees and looked at the man and said, You bought me to set me free. Oh, you bought me to set me free. You paid a higher price than anyone else has ever paid just to set you free, me free. I want nothing else but to serve you forever. Oh, Father God, let us understand who we are Not just who we were before we were redeemed and bought by the blood, but who we truly are today, Father. Servants, but happy servants. Unneeded, but wanted. Unprofitable, but yet valued by the Almighty Father, God. We call you who you truly are. Lord, in the truest sense, you are our master. If there's been any point where we have missed the point of that or lost concentration on uh, on the, the very price of the redemption, get our eyes back on that today. Let our eyes be like that servant, that handmaiden who is constantly looking to the hand of her master for the slightest twitch of that hand looking looking harder and harder till we can see the mercy and the love of God oh I thank you that I'm a bond servant I thank you that this responsibility is not on me I thank you Lord that yes I'm a child yes I'm a son yes I'm loved by the almighty God but there is security in being a bond servant that you paid a price higher than anyone else has ever paid only to set us free. Lord, let us serve you with reverence and in awe forever. Lord, if there's anyone that's listening to this today, that they have not come under lordship of the Messiah, have not come under his kingship, have not counted themselves as a servant, have not been redeemed, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would touch their hearts right now. And if that's you, you feel that tugging and you don't really know how to rationalize it or you don't know what it means, I want you to say, just say this prayer. It doesn't do anything. Your faith doesn't do anything, but open the door for God to come in. You just agree with me in faith. Pray this prayer after me. Say, Father... I understand that you bought me at a price to set me free. I accept that love today and I only want to serve you forever. I know I've been a sinner. I've lived for myself but now I want to live for you. Believe that Yeshua rose from the dead. And I declare right now that he is my Lord and my King. In Yeshua's name, amen. If you pray that prayer, I encourage you to contact us and reach out to us and the methods that we have below. We want to get in touch with you and contact you. But I want to bless you before you go. 
Father, I thank you. We, we pray your blessing upon every one of these that are listening, every one of these under the sound of my voice. Lord, bless you and keep you. Let his face shine upon you. Light of his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you his peace. God bless you today. I hope you have a wonderful, blessed Shabbat or whenever you're watching this. We love you. We thank you. We hope to see you together soon. And if you are local in this area, we encourage you to connect with the community group or meet us in the park on Shabbat at 10 a.m. if you're comfortable the next time we gather together. God bless you.